Hey, it's Joe West from the West Farm with Mike Shimshek. Today, we have the one and only Frank Filippetti, my favorite engineer in the world. That's not something I say on every podcast. It no. is on this podcast. I've gone on for years and years saying that I secretly wish I was Frank Filippetti or had his superpowers. <laughs> this is very true, Frank, by the way. I've heard him say it off the record. Too. Wow. We, we've yeah. talked to a lot of people, Frank, and I got to tell you, you're my favorite. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about Frank. He's been associated with such great recordings that I want to tell you, not just like some of the artists he's worked with, but he did. I want to I want to know what love is for Foreigner, which was their biggest song ever. Lick it up for Kiss. Pay attention to the diversity of this stuff. Coming around again for Carly Simon. Eternal Flame for the Bangles. Hourglass, the, the Grammy Award winning record. Best engineered album and best pop record. He engineered and produced that record, which I want to get into a little bit today because it's a fascinating story. Uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart from Bonnie Tyler, seven-time Grammy Award, Award winner, ten times nominated. He's worked with artists like Barbara Streisand, Andrew Bocelli, Ray Charles, Billy Joel, Mariah Carey, Madonna, Elton John, Rod Stewart, Paul McCartney. Does a ton of Five One. Does a ton of Broadway film, uh, not Broadway. Um, you know the cast albums that are wildly successful and winning Grammys. He's an extraordinary producer and engineer. So welcome to the show, Frank Filippetti. Hey, thanks so much for that intro, Joe. I'm going to have to, uh, <laughs> I don't know, suddenly uh, I came here with all kinds of confidence and now I'm shrunk down to how am I going to live up to that? <laughs> right? Isn't that something about a career, huh? You look back at it, you squeeze it into a paragraph, you're like, holy smokes, what am I doing? Imposter syndrome. Well, can I tell, I want to tell a real quick story before we get into it. This is how I met Frank Filippetti. I was up in a, a private billionaire's studio in upstate New York making a record, and I had to take a little break. I was doing the Seventh House, or a rock record for Seventh House, so being on Atlantic, and I had to take a break because I had another session coming in. It was a very odd scenario of the studio. We won't get into that, but in coming into this studio for the time that I had to take this window was Frank Filippetti, Phil Ramone. I think it was Simon Phillips. Bunny Burnell was playing bass. It was just like, come on. And I, rather than taking the train back down to New York City and grow hair and sit on my couch, Frank Filippetti said, hey, why don't you stay and help us? You know, you can sit, you know, help me, you can assist, whatever. So I got to sit there and sit behind the great Frank Filippetti and Phil Ramone and watch them do their thing. And I can remember one story that I think I may have even told this on the podcast. I remember watching Frank because I was such a fan. He had done a record for James Taylor earlier in 1985 called That's Why I'm Here. And it was literally one of these songs, the, first, that, the title track for that record. When you're going from studio to studio in New York City, you needed some form of, form of normalcy to know what the monitors were. I used that song for, for years in New York City to say, how accurate is this room? So I'm up there and I'm watching Frank, this guy that I had sort of followed around in, in my mind at least and listening to his records. And I, he started choosing mics. And I'm like, that's the mic I would use. And then he started placing mics. And I'm like, it's totally where I put it. <laughs> yep, I do that too. That mic pre, yep. Oh, those compressors? I do that to my overheads. <laughs> you know, and I just sort of was feeling really great about myself. And then there was this what happened moment where the <laughs> band starts playing. And up come the faders. And Frank is, you know, his, his, the details are in the faders uh, with Frank. He brings them up. And at that moment, I thought to myself, like, what ha did I fall asleep for an hour? Because it sounded <laughs> nothing like any of the records I made. <laughs> All the same mics. You know, it, I just thought to myself, isn't that something? That's the beauty of making records is that it's in someone's DNA. And it's just that chemistry when they make a record, you can tell who did it. And you're one of those guys. And um, I love that story because it is just beyond me. It's, you know, it's the beauty. I sound like me. I wish I sounded like you, but uh, this, <laughs> when Frank does a record, it is just the cr most crystal clear, but warm record in largest record you're ever going to listen to coming out of those speakers. And he's done it again and again and been a part of these amazing records. But that's my Frank Filippetti story. And um, it's just, you know, to get to work and with your heroes. you're sticking with it. <laughs> that's how I recall it. You know how it goes after all these years, right? Well, you know, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just talking to someone about this the other day. Um, I started engineering in uh, 1980. I had prior to that, I had been a singer songwriter, uh, or I thought I was. A, let's put it that way. I thought I was a singer songwriter. 
Uh, when I got out of college, I came into Manhattan, got a record deal and then a publishing deal. And that provided me some kind of an, uh, an income. And, uh, and I kicked around for the next nine years trying to become uh, a useful, uh, if not uh, lucrative, uh, singer-songwriter. Um, and uh, never happened, really. Um, and uh, so at the last, you know, at, at, at the moment when my record career died and my publishing deal was not um, uh, resumed and uh, my girlfriend threw me out of the apartment that we had been living in, I was uh, 30 years old and I'm in New York City with no income, no place to live and no future. And uh, I, I said to myself, you know, whenever I used to go around with my songwriter demos, people used to say, well, I'm, the songs aren't really hitting me, but I really like the sound of them. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I'm thinking there, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I come up with this, maybe I could engineer, you know, why not? Let's try it. Because, you know, I certainly had a familiarity around tape machines. I used to, you know, uh, make uh, my song demos uh, before I started with Screen Gems, my publisher. Then they would take me to a demo studio, uh, a place called Right Track Recording downtown on 23rd Street. They had a 16-track uh, analog machine with DBX, if you all remember, DBX noise, comp you know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, noise reduction. Compansion. Yeah, the noise <laughs> reduction. And um, we used to do our demos there for $50 an hour or something like that. Um, and... Uh, so I understood the recording process and I said, maybe this is what I need to do, you know? So um, I went down to the owner of that studio, Simon Andrews. We had been, uh, we used to talk, you know, during my demos and stuff about sound and we had a like mind. And I said, look, uh, I'm 30 years old. I think I'd be really good at engineering, but I can't be an assistant for two or three years. I need to, I need to feel like I'm accomplishing something. And he said, I'll give you a shot. So he hired me as an engineer at 175 a week, uh, which was a little bit less, which was 75 less than my 250 a week I was getting from um, Screen Gems. But that still meant I could live in New York and still pay for my apartment. I ate a little less, but so what? You know, $75 less a week. Um, and uh, I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And I worked at it for about six months. Um, and by then, it had become chief engineer at the studio. Um, and the, by the end of that year, uh, he had found a new uh, facility on 48th Street. And he and I started building what is actually now or was, you know, right track recording for right. the next 40 years. The same um, studio. But... Uh, the, the reason for the story is that because I started uh, on my own and I wasn't under a Bob Clear Mountain or I didn't train under a Val Garay or I didn't train under an Al Schmidt or, you know, anyone like that uh, or an Elliot Shiner, I, I had to learn it on my own. I mean, I was doing this day in, day out by just figuring things out. And, um, so you start to feel as if over the course of time that you invented these things because, you know, you figured it out on your own. So I invented this way to, to do the overheads and I invented this vocal chain and I invented this, you know, and then you sit there and you talk with Al Schmidt or you talk with Ed Cherney and you say, you know, and they say, what? I've been doing that for 30 years, you know, so suddenly, suddenly you realize that your inventions aren't really inventions at all. Yeah. You, you know, you great. You happen to, to come upon a process that other guys have been doing, but you didn't invent it. So get right. over it. We talk about that too, a little bit. Uh, is that it's how surprising it is because we're so isolated in what we do that when we do get to hang with people, we realize, oh, my goodness, like I was sitting behind you, all the <laughs> different outcomes. <laughs> but, yeah. Hey, can you turn your – do you have a mic pre? Yes. 
can you turn it just down maybe if it was at 12 o'clock turn it to 11 and right. i'll adjust later how's that is that good i just don't want you to be distorted I yeah couldn't, no, i God couldn't forbid. take it I couldn't take I, it. You know, so, everybody would say, oh, well, that's because Philip Petty, he's a digital guy, and he just doesn't understand <laughs> the analog side. Well, check this out. You told me, I don't know, I'm sure you don't remember me from that session. Maybe you do. But they were talking, this has probably got to be 15, 20 years. It's got to be 20 years ago. Um, you told me, and in that session, you said, hey, I just did this record. I did it up at James's place, James Taylor's, and we put two OTRs together and we use the mic pre's in the console to record this record. And I think it's one of the best things I've ever done. And then you went on to mix that record at right track on the, on the Capricorn. Uh, and then I was mastering a record with Ted Jensen. You had done a five, one mix for that record as well as the stereo mixes and Ted said, I told him what a fan I was of yours. And, and, and he said, sit down. And he played me the five, one and that record I just imagined what my impression of what O2R mic freeze were at that part point. They were not, they were not sought after. Let's say that nobody was pulling them out of the consoles and racking them up in their studio. Right. Right. And you had made this record hourglass that ended up being uh, the win. You wanted it as a producer, you won best pop record, but you also West, Be you won best engineered record. You engineered that record as well. Tell me a little bit about how that went down. And cause I just, I love the idea that you're like, I don't care. James needs to record here. We're going to make it great regardless of what we have. Tell, tell us how that record came about and some of the details. Well, I, uh, the, the idea of doing it with an O2R and so forth came about. Uh, I didn't go up there and just say, uh, let's just use the minimum amount of gear we can to record the band. Basically, James said, um, I haven't put out a, uh, album of my own material in in five years he had uh he had released a few years earlier the uh, live album i think it was a double album if i'm not mistaken uh which george massenberg had done but he hadn't put out new material in five years and so i said uh oh uh, i'd love to you know um i'm and uh he says, all right, put together a package. Let's, I want to do it up in Martha's Vineyard. I don't want to do it in New York. Um, I'm going to go up there with my band. And uh, it's more like a woodshed experiment. It's like, I don't, some of the songs aren't even finished yet. Um, I'm going to rehearse them with the band as we go along. So um, that's the idea. So, you know, me thinking, okay, uh, I just uh, fell in love with this Capricorn console, which I, I really, to this day, it's my favorite console of all time. But um, um, I fell in love with it. And I, I talked to the folks at Neve and they said, okay, we're going to, uh, we have a, a little 16 channel Capricorn. We're uh, here in, in England. We're going to send it over to you so you can use it there. Um, I talked to, uh, uh, rental companies. I had a Sony 3348 ready to go up there. I had Mike Prees. I had the whole thing all set to go. And I told James and, and sent him a budget and he says, Wait, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> hold on. No, no. I don't even know if we have a record. He says, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm working with ideas here. I, I don't want to. You know, and I don't want this to be this big record. I want it to almost you are just recording us rehearsing. And he said, so can you put something together that, you know, a minimal package? So I says, well, OK, I'll, let's see what, you know, suddenly I'm a little deflated. But so what? OK, so uh, I talked to a friend of mine at that point, Peter Chaikin. I knew they had just come out with this O2. Yam he was working at Yamaha at the time. They had just come out with the O2R console. It was brand new. Um, and uh, uh, I said, well, uh, we only took one up. I only I had one O2R. And so we did the whole thing on just the one unit. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, you know, I said, uh, I'm going to bring up a couple of microphones, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the O2R with its pre's and we'll go up uh, with a rack of three DA88s to, so we can go 24 track. So 
we got up there, recorded the sessions at 44 1, uh, 16 on the DA 88. Oh my God. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the beauty was the DA 88s, they were really good at locking up quickly and stuff. So we, uh, we, day one, we get everybody set up. It was a small little cottage. Um, and it was an interesting arrangement, though. Uh, it was like a, there were, there was a, a left side of the cottage and a right side of the cottage. And then there was a foyer in between. Uh, and on the left side was a bedroom and then uh, the foyer, then there was a living room and then the kitchen was over b beyond the living room. Um, so I set up James uh, in the um, bedroom uh, with a mic and uh, guitar mic, and it had sliding glass doors into the foyer. So beautiful. Close the doors. James can see into the foyer. He can see into the living room, which also was sliding glass doors into the for foyer. So I put um, Carlos Vega in the living room and um, then put some plexiglass around him. And uh, then Jimmy Johnson and um, uh, Clifford Carter, uh, the keyboard play player, uh, I put in the foyer with me because uh, Jimmy was, you know, just bass direct in. And um, uh, Clifford was direct from his keyboards. So and then I monitored with headphones. Um, and I also think I had my at that point, I was still using the Genelec. Uh, S30Cs uh, monitors. Um, and that was it. Uh, no external gear, no external preamps, nothing. And um, so day two, we start doing the actual recordings uh, after getting everybody set up and all the lines and the mics run. And I'm listening. I'm saying, geez, this is something awfully good. Uh, but I'm figuring, you know, well, you know, that's because I've got my S30Cs right in front of me, like not more than a foot or two away. Well, maybe two feet away. And, you know, on this tight little arrangement, I'm saying, this is something great. So we spend the next week and a half, two weeks recording all everything. And then um, I said, you know, James says, all right, let's take a break. We'll go into New York uh, and early. This was, I think either late April or early May on the vineyard. So it wasn't during the busy time. So there was no noises or things like that. And uh, I think a couple of, oh, I think it was early June. We go into the studio, uh, right track at that point. And I put it up. I put the rough mixes up um, that we had done on the O2R. And we listened to everything we recorded in the studio. And we both kind of looked at each other and said, really? Holy shit. This sounds amazing. And we're all just kind of, how, uh, how does that thinking, happen? How, how, how yeah. does that happen in 40, 44, 116 bit, yeah. you know, preamps that you want to punch yourself in the face when you hear them, you know, how does yeah, that happen? I, you know, and I'm like, uh, because this was my first really full experience of doing digital from beginning to end. And, and, and I'm, I'm just saying this is, is this really what's possible? And, 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 uh, and I'm still thinking we're fooling ourselves, but I says, okay, so what we're going to do is we transferred all the uh, DA 88 to Sony 3348 um, and uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. And uh, then James says, look, I think this is an album. So instead of re-recording, because that was the original plan, we'll get into a real studio and record it. He says, let's, let's just add some overdubs. You know, I've always wanted to hear Stevie Wonder on a uh, little more time with you. I, I, I love the idea of the harmonica. Let's put Branford Masalis on Gaia. Let's, uh, you know, and it was just that, that kind of vibe, like let's add some additional elements but uh, let's put Yo-Yo Ma on um, uh, enough to be on your way, you know, and uh, um, because we had done all the background vocals, all the other stuff uh, on the vineyard. So 
it was like, um, okay, uh, no, we didn't do the background vocals. That's right. We went to LA after we transferred it, we went to LA, um, spent two days with James's background singers. Um, and, um, um, then we, uh, and I think we did uh, one or two overdubs, like um, in Gaia. There's a Tom Phil. I was going to ask uh, you about halfway that. Halfway through, uh, and we decided to double it. Uh, so the he has his original Tom Phil that we recorded on the vineyard, and then with um, um, brushes, uh, he did the same fill, and uh, that was it. So we came back to New York. Uh, added uh, the additional people on it and then mixed it. And people say, oh, so it was mixed on the Capricorn. And I said, yeah, but we were always a being the final mixes to the things we had gotten off the O2R. And we were consciously trying to match those mixes. They were wow. so good. So uh, that really... Uh, blew me away. One about the capabilities of digital. Two about the fact that for five thousand dollars you could buy a console that could that could make an album that sounded like this. And three, it so impressed me that the next year I went down. Uh, I used to do a show with Phil Ramone, uh, Pavarotti and Friends, um, in uh, Modena, Italy. We'd go to Modena for two weeks and uh, put together the show, which had Pavarotti with Sting and with Rod Stewart and with the Spice Girls and, um, you know, and uh, Celine Dion and Mariah Carey. And it would be like 10 or 12 artists uh, would be on each show and they would do two songs. One, their popular song at the moment, um, and the second one would be a neoclassical or classical piece with Pavarotti. <clears throat> so um, we went to, so we do this every year. And I had been using analog consoles up until that point to do the show, which were a real pain in the neck. Because, of course, if you've done these kind of shows like the Grammys or something like that, you realize that if you have 10 or 12 acts, all who come on within five minutes of each other, you're really stuck in the sense that between each act, you've got to, you've got to pull down all the faders, change the mic pre's, change the um, gains on the mic pre's. You have to change the inputs and the balances and all that. So you'd write all this stuff down. Uh, to recall because it was no, uh, you know, no, none of the trucks had total recall or any of that. So you would just do it, you, you and your assistants, you'd be doing this by hand between the five minutes of the next act. So um, it was a real pain and you'd always miss something. And it's one button um, push on an O2R. There was, no. And, and on top of that, this was a live mix, worldwide live feed. In other words, it wasn't like I could go in and, and do it later, which we did for a CD, but we did an on-air mix of, of the show live. So I had to get as much right as possible. Well, suddenly this idea comes to me. Wow, with this O2R, I could just, it has scene memories. I can just hit a button, and this is the Spice Girls. And then I can hit a button, and, uh, you know, this is uh, Eric Clapton. And then hit a button. And this is Stevie Wonder. And I'm saying, wait a minute, that's too cool. So that's when, when I hit upon the idea, let's bring, out, bring down six O2Rs and join them together. And we'll use the analog console in the truck simply as a monitor. But all the input to the tape machine is going to be these O2Rs. And uh, we did that, and it was very successful, actually, um, and uh, not without its travails. In fact, we have a video up on the web. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, um, a fellow, uh, Peter Chaikin, had recorded us working during that week and all the problems that we ran into, um, including a hailstorm. Um, 
in the middle of June, but uh, it's a, it's an entertaining video. It's about 10 or You've got a lot minutes. of really great videos on your website. I just stumbled upon them on frankforthepetty.com. No, oh, I haven't great. even updated that. I've got to, I've really got to get on. That. Well, I just, I just found that site. I didn't know you had one until, until I was looking for the, the research for this. And I, there's some really good videos on there. Go ahead, Mike. I got a question for you, um, Frank, <clears throat> back to the hourglass, the, 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 you know, 44, one 16 bit. What are your thoughts on sample rate right now? I'm dying. I'm dying. No, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I think that uh, 96 K or 88 two uh regardless of which one you prefer but i think uh 96k at 24 bit is about as good an uh an audio format as we've ever had uh i think it beats anything in the analog world um and um i think it's as close to what i feel is what i'm trying to accomplish emotionally in the listener that I can come to. Um, 182, uh, 364, um, I have to admit it. Um, I, I think, I think I, I feel, uh, you know, I have a feeling that it sounds better, but for the life of me, you know, uh, you know, George Mastenberg swears by it and he's got ears like a bat. So I, I get that. But for me, and, and, and my hearing being that I was a drummer uh, in my musician days um, drops off rapidly at 4K. So, <laughs> so you know, that's just, that's just something you're going to have to, I have you, to deal with. What, what do you think of 32 bit float point? Oh, that I am a big believer in. Right. Um, uh, Pro Tools, I, I, I never went, uh, I was using Steinberg's Nuendo for the first 10 years of the aughts, uh, you know, 2000 to whatever, 2010, until uh, because it was 32-bit floating point. And I just felt it sounded superior in so many ways to Pro Tools, which I felt sounded very one-dimensional. Um, and they used to say, well, we do 48-bit math, uh, but they only do 24-bit math in the TDM bus. And in any event, it just didn't sound good to me. Um, but, uh, then they went, I think it was with pro tools 10, uh, they then went to the 32 bit system, 32 bit floating point. And that was the, the door opener for me. Yeah. Um, I went to pro tools then not because I didn't like new window. I love new window, but you know, I get a lot of things in from other people to mix. And it was a real pain in the ass going from Nuendo. There was no real direct conversion. And so, and on top of that, I had just found this, the, the console that I'm still using, the, uh, the Avid D command, which is a 24 fader system that, that's basically a controller for Pro Tools. And the folks that put this together, a lot of them cut their teeth on the Capricorn. And so it has a lot of the operating characteristics and features of the Capricorn. So <clears throat> that's what I, I went. I got one of those. <clears throat> I had a System 5, Euphonic System 5, in my studio at Right Track. But in my little studio at home, I, I went with the, the, uh, this little console. And... Um, when uh, I gave up my studio, I sold the System 5, and uh, I still am on this, and I'm pr it's probably time for an upgrade, but, you know, I've, I've loved it. It's been my baby for so many years that I they hold on to it. But to answer your question, um, I think bit rate, beyond 96K, bit rate is more important to me than sample rate. Um, I know that you, you know, uh, and I also did uh, from James's album to, uh, which was about 97, I think, up until about 2002, 2003, most of my multi-track mixes uh, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, surround mixes were all done in DSD multi-channel, not in DVDA. Uh, unfortunately, DSD multi-channel didn't take off, but DSD is a one-bit format. 
Um, on or off. And uh, yeah. And so it's, it's uh, uh, because it's a one bit format, the sample rate is uh, at the time was 1.24 million bits, you know, per second, as opposed to the 96 K this was 1.24 million. Um, but it's only one bit, the sample rate, it, yeah. but it's only one bit. Um, so, but the idea is you sample it so often um, and the one the, bit only tells you whether this, the, what's the next bit is either rising or falling. Mm -hmm. So if it's rising, it's, it's a one, if it's falling, it's a zero. Right. So now you got a million of these per second. And what does that do? Well, it traces out a waveform. Not only does it trace out a waveform, it's an analog waveform. Right. At a million. So in a sense, in essence, DSD <clears throat> is a digital representation of the analog waveform. <clears throat> hmm. And I love the format and it was terrific. But I've um, heard so much about that. I've never worked with it, but I've been hearing guys, buddies talk about it and just say that there used to be these CD players that were one bit <clears throat> that were pretty spectacular. And it just seemed like, you know, so the bit rate goes for those who are maybe not totally up correct me if I'm wrong Frank bits go up the side here they measure they're sort of like you're if you were in a swimming pool they'd be measuring the height of the swimming pool and then you're you go from <laughs> left to right with your music and you either look at us you look at a song 48,000 times a second 96,000 you know and that and you know so you get more resolute it'd be like the buildings that would come up on that timeline and you would then use quantization yeah. to round them off but the bit rate the higher you got the bit rate the more accurate you got that but this right. with and so many samples that the bit rate almost doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, the, the idea is that each bit is a level. So uh, you have uh, at, uh, at uh, 44 or at 48 K or 44 one um, 16 bit, you have 65,000 uh, level variations. So, um, you know, let's say uh, you're at uh, 10.1 dB on, on this sample, and then the next sample, you're at 10.126 and so forth. So you have 67,000 of these or 65,000 of these variations. Now, when you double the sample rate, <clears throat> you have twice as many. However, when you, when you go to 24 bit, you have like, I don't know, 256 uh, uh, 256 hundred thousand, or I, I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but <clears throat> the idea being that you if you have a, if you have a graph, you have level up and down and you have your timeline. And what happens is as each bit comes along, it's each time it takes a snapshot and it's recording the level and it's recording the time that it happens. So, mm -hmm. uh, the more bits you have, the more of these little little dots you have um and the finer the, the gradations on your level now the problem is at sixty-five thousand uh level changes up in the 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 minus 10 to plus 10 area you've got a lot of resolution but as you get you know right. uh, imagine your fader as you drag your fader closer and closer to infinite off those last little bits there are, uh, are, are what is, you know, our, our steps because you don't, you know, whereas up here, you don't hear the steps down here. When it gets really, really soft, you can hear the steps. Gotcha. And, um, and because what they call the least significant bit is, is the last bit before you got nothing. That bit goes from, on to totally off. And so the, the less resolution you have, the more you hear that. And um, so, you know, many times they'll show you the digital waveform as steps. It's not really steps because at the end of the day, those digital waveforms are converted to an analog device and no analog device does those steps. So, when, when, when people try to tell you digital is all steps, it's wrong because the analog devices slide, they don't step. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, as you get to the higher sample rates and the, the longer bit depth, 
now suddenly what you've done is that step, which used to be one step from least significant bit to zero, now is 100 steps. And now suddenly you're fading off well below the, the ability to hear it. Um, Dude, I'm laughing thing, right now because it's like, what if this guy had become a songwriter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're talking well, it's like this is not this is so like you've got a you've got the right the right half the creative half and you've got the left half of the brain and it's like <laughs> i just thank god that you didn't become a songwriter <laughs> yeah a lot of people do we wouldn't <laughs> be having this, we wouldn't be having this conversation no, 35 no, years later not. but you know when it comes to left brain right brain the 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 master of the world is george massenberg yeah. Uh, he actually designs automation systems. Right. He actually invented the parametric equalizer that we all use. So, so uh, I have a bit of it. I was a physics major in college, but where George goes is where no man has gone before. Hey, I've got. I've, I wanted to ask you a couple more questions about hourglass. So, when you were recording that, did you EQ to the D eighty eight or that's D eighty eight? Yeah. Yeah, D eighty eight. So, were you um, using the EQ on the O two R? I, I believe I was using it somewhat. Um, I, I have a philosophy, though, basically. I don't like to EQ going into the tape machine or storage device. Um, I feel if I've got to EQ something to a certain degree, um, the mic's in the wrong place. Gotcha. I mean, that's been my philosophy. I just think... You know, equalization works on phase and antiphase. And, and so what happens is um, EQing, say, 1K means uh, there's a place before 1K and after 1K where things get a little mushy. So um, I try, if, if I've got to do a subtle EQ, I'm going to do something with the mic. Um, if I've got to do a massive EQ, I'm going to change the mic. I mean, right. um, to me, it's uh, uh, now that that's 90% of the time on a kick drum, I'll do massive EQs. Okay. Because I don't want the kick drum to sound like a real kick drum. I want it to sound like the kick drum. I want it to sound like on a pop song. So kick drums don't sound like that. You know, if you're a drummer, you know what a kick drum sounds like, and it doesn't sound like what we call a great kick drum sound on, 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 on a record. So there are certain things where I'm looking for something different, but if I'm looking for reality, um, I tend to think reality is as good as it's going to get. So why right. should I have to fuck with it? Or I get I it. Know if I can say that or why yeah, should I just have to did. Do? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but reality is what it is. And that's what I'm trying to capture because at the end of the day, I'm trying to capture emotion, not sound. Right. And for me, the emotional content is in what these folks are doing, what they're playing and how they're playing it. And um, so I tend not to do much. That doesn't mean I won't. Well, and a real, a real guy has real vision and, and has the faculties to accomplish it. will know what to honor as authentic. You want to not mess with the acoustic guitar sound too much on james taylor you want it to be this thing right right but it's like you do know that you need to manhandle the kick drum and you're willing to scale that it's there's not a one role fits all right. scenarios you know what you need to defy reality with to build this illusion you know it's all just a sleight of hand card trick when you're making these records it's like i tell people all the time go put your drums in the middle of a cornfield way out in the middle of a field you're not going to like the way that they sound <laughs> right. you like the room <laughs> doing this yeah. to your drums you know yeah. you want to find the right room but it's like yeah. a lot of what we guitars i mean look at what a guitar speaker does to a probably a, a guitar right into the console it sounds insanely bad or put it through a pa speaker that has a horn and a tweeter you know we put them through these single range speakers to do things to them it's these are all part of the sleight of hand right and the real masters know when to do that uh, and speaking about putting emotion into a song, I was going to tell you during that Tom thing in Gaia, I was at, at the mastering lab listening to that. And I, and I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh. So like, it doesn't come natural to me to cry, but I like my eyes watered <laughs> up. 
<laughs> well, you've got to. We will put a link to that song, and I'll put the timestamp. There is a Tom Phil in this that is so big. I don't even know how you get that much low end into a Tom and have it still not explode everything it put. It goes. It sounds perfect. I want you to tell me how you did that. <laughs> is well, there a that, trick to that? It, there was a trick. Uh, there were a couple of tricks. <clears throat> The first one was I, um, I knew that I wanted that to be a special moment. Um, and first of all, it was just such a beautifully musical Tom Phil that Carlos Vega put in there. Uh, and Carlos, uh, we really lost one of the true greats when but he was as musical a drummer as, uh, as I've ever worked with. And I appreciate drummers because of my, my past. And, uh, but I knew uh, I wanted to make that a special moment. Uh, the first thing was I wanted it to be large and powerful. Um, and I, as I was mixing, every time I got to it, uh, no matter what I did to it, it just didn't, it didn't create the power that I wanted. And so uh, the first thing I did is a mixing trick that I invented. <laughs> you know uh no I, I, a mixing thing where um coming out of the the uh sax solo uh i'm gradually bringing the entire mix down um about uh i think it, it turned out to be about 2 db um if you listen to it really carefully you can hear it but if you don't know it's happening you won't so I'm bringing James's voice and guitar and stuff down a couple of dB uh, to the point of that fill and then pop it back up to, to zero again. So that was the first thing that gave me uh, some of the impact that I was needing. The second thing was we had done the, the doubled overdub. So you have the tom along with the brushes on the tom and one of the great things or one of the secrets that many people don't know, um, but many do, but, but uh, if, you, if you've really paid attention to your craft, you'll note that hitting a tom-tom soft or a bass drum soft creates a much larger resonant bloom than hitting it hard. It almost sounds you know, anti-intuitive, but that's the fact. If you put a mic right up to a tom or a bass drum and, and hit it with a stick very softly, you get a huge, huge low end. Um, so the brushes created that same effect. So that at and without the tap, because if, if, if you had a tap on the second drum, the two taps could, could have smeared each other out you know, unless I time aligned them and did all that wasn't the idea. So by doing the, the brushes, it, it's, it gave us that low end without, um, uh, without the, 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 um, the conflict of timing, the, uh, uh senior moment here. Uh, Jesus, I can't even think of that word. And it's, it's like, I can't think of it either, but I know what you're saying. Is it flam. time alignment? Flam. No, the oh, flaming. flaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Flaming. Wow. That's, <laughs> that is a... That's we all a had problem. it. We were like, I don't know what... <laughs> so, uh, so there was that, uh, but so it was the, the two bass, the, the two drums. And then the third thing was um, I always mixed with my trusty DBX-122... Um, um, what did they call it? Uh harmonic synthesizer or something i don't oh, know it yeah was a, yeah it yeah. was the, the sonic the maximizer one rack unit yeah and it, it uh, had two frequencies at the bottom uh you could tune it for either 60 or 120 and it would generate a tone at that frequency mm. to go along with the drum or 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 the bass or whatever it is that that, that. so i added that in and uh bob's your uncle <laughs> Do you remember what the microphones were on the toms? Yes. Uh, it's been the same microphones that I've used, I think, since they came out. Uh, the Audio Technica, uh, a, a, uh, the, um, um, mine were the ATM, 
uh, 350. Um, well, it, it's just the reason I'm thinking is because they've changed the model number. I think it's now right. called the AT350. Uh, back then, it was an ATM3 something. But in any event, they're, they're, uh, they're small little lavalier mics um, on a gooseneck, and you can clip them to the tom. So I like them because I was getting tired of um, either compromising my sound or compromising the player playing uh, by telling them not to hit the microphones. Because to get, the, uh, to get a, a, a Shure uh, SM7 or a uh, 57 or a Sennheiser 421 or any of the standard Tom mics, close enough to, to get the sound that I was looking for. I'm always getting drummer hitting it or something in a moment of frenzy or what have you, you know, some drummers I used to, uh, I, when I mix, I mix with my eyes closed. Well, when I played, I used to play too. And I would just be, you know, and not paying attention. So, um, I, I started using these, uh, what, what were basically, we used to call them bug mics, B-U-G, bug mics, because uh, they were like bugs. We'd put them on the violins in a string section to get the individual strings. And um, so I put them on the toms, and uh, I've loved them ever since. They've just... They, where they, do, you, do you attribute all that low end to the DBX unit, or was it something you did a lot of EQ? It was probably the the tone being generated underneath it um i i i'd say 50 50 i'd say uh, i didn't do a lot of eq i mean uh if you listen to that whole album um like in um, um line them up and so forth when when he hits that tom that low tom he just got a great low end out of his tom it was um, stunning and hearing all the details of how you got that sound it sounds so organic when you listen to the record that you would never believe that any of that voodoo was going on well that's that's what we do isn't it i mean that's what you do th th well no i mean but that's that's <laughs> the idea is that um we are, are, are the the uh the sound is serviced by the art and 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 the idea is uh, in every song, I'm looking to create an emotional arc. I'm looking to take you on a journey. So, you know, it's not just listening to a song and dancing to it or whatever. I'm, I'm trying to create a story in the sound. Um, it's funny, over, over the, my lifetime in listening to music, I'm constantly amazed at my two daughters who, when they listen to music, after one or two uh, listens, they can quote the lyrics to you. Mm -hmm. I have listened to Joni Mitchell's Hajira, which is one of my favorite albums of all time, maybe 500 times. I don't know. I still can't quote you the lyrics to, to <laughs> most of it. I'm, I'm listening not to right. the I poetry. And, and some people do. I'm listening to the emotion of the record Joni is singing and, and occasionally a, a poet a poetic line comes through um you know she'll start singing something and there'll be this 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 beautiful background to her and um uh and then the next thing you know uh uh between the forceps and the stone comes out and i'm thinking wow what a great line and how that audio just came to, you know, to service that. And uh, those are the things that I'm looking for. So when I'm doing these, these songs, I'm hoping exactly what you said, that it, that it is organic because I'm thinking of it in an organic way. I only have the inorganic devices to make that happen, but I'm hoping that um, I can use it, uh, in, you know, in service of the art. Yeah, I think that's a great point. When I was young, all I cared about was how things felt. I've since become a big fan of lyrics. And if you can partner the two of those together, well, then yes. you get something that just is like it disassembles you. But cool. when I was listening to a lot of these records as a kid, I wouldn't even know what the lyrics were. I just knew that they felt right. It seems like nowadays we've gotten into a different culture where it's like we 
we've given up the one in a million so that we could have maybe better consistency, but we've lost the extraordinary results that were that would come from those recordings that made you really feel something. And then, you know, maybe you get a great lyric on top of it and it's just, it's over at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel like we have as, as extraordinary of outcomes as we used to have when no. we did get it right, but we may get it right more often now. I don't know if this is making, if it's just translating what I'm saying. No, it's translating. I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly the way I feel. I think we have a, a, a number of amazing artists out there right now, but I think, the way we're producing them and the way that they are being marketed and what have you, um, uh, and the ability just to rise above the noise um, makes, it, uh, makes it difficult to be truly unique. Yeah. You know, um, uh, you know my, one of my heroes and wasn't necessarily at the time, but more so after I started working on his material is Frank Zappa. Um, you know, once I started getting deep into his material and past the scatological and, and, and the, you know, some of the things he did, uh, his true genius really started to emerge for me. When I did uh, a couple of years ago, I recorded... Um, the uh, uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra at Disney Hall uh, with Ezepeka Salonen uh, was a conductor. Um, he had picked for their 10th anniversary concert, Frank Zappa's 200 Motels Suite. Wow. Um, and so uh, I went to LA to record it and it was one of the most musically edifying moments of my career. Um, it was terrifying recording all those people at Disney Hall for one concert only, so we didn't have a chance to fix things or stuff. But um, just getting, starting to get into reading the score and seeing what he put into these things musically, um, was uh, and this this a person who who never really went to uh you know a music school or or had a degree in you know in in uh, composition um was quite was quite remarkable i think there's a phrase that uh, gail gail uh, or a story gail zappa used to tell tell me about frank he um um he was a big fan of um um, was it Verez? Yes, Verez, and uh, the composer. And um, he, he, the first time he heard it, um, he was just uh, in, in, in awe of, of the composition. And he turned to Gail and said, I think I'm going to write me some of that. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> okay. As if it's that easy. You know, yeah. For and, him, it uh, was. Yeah, but, you know, but he did, you know, and he was, uh, um, you know, uh, when people would ask him what he did, he says, I just put, uh, I, I, I put black dots on paper, you know, uh, and, and so. Well, how do you deal it. with when you're talking about like, just through this interview, you've everything you mentioned inadvertently is a session that would terrify me to go into the idea to like, I was thinking the same, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I'm responsible for getting, you know, Pavarotti and, you know, Billy Joel and Barbara Streisand and Bocelli it's giant symphonies. Like you take this on. And I, I mean, I don't know that there's a better guy in the world to take on a situation like that than you, but it's just such a, a giant thing. Is, is what's your level of ego security versus total <laughs> stress and anxiety? anxiety? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, there, there have been moments where I have said to myself, why am I choosing something as a profession where I have to prove myself every day, you know, why didn't I choose something where I could just do the same thing over and over right. and not have to prove every day that I'm good at it. Um, I guess it's the challenge. And uh, um, I've always been relatively fearless, uh, at least on the outside, uh, on the inside, I could be, you know, swimming in an absolute muck, but on the outside, um, I've always been reasonably good at hiding that. Um, 
but more so, I think, I think the real thing is I wanted to do it. Yeah. And I would be very, right. very disappointed in myself if I didn't try it. Um, just like, just like everything I've done in my life, I don't want to look back in 20 years after the fact and say, I wished I'd have done that. Um, I'd rather fail at it than, than wow. not have tried it. How so, many times would you have say you, would you say that you did have a unrecoverable failure that was out of all the times you've tried and all these extraordinary situations of, because a lot of the stuff with the cast albums and with symphonies, this isn't stressful. I've done, I did a 55 piece symphony at ocean way and it would, that, that can end you, you know, it's, there's a lot that can go wrong there. How many well, times have you taken the, on something and failed? Especially at the rate that uh, it, it, those sessions go for, you could be, you know, you could be uh, in a session that costs 20 grand an hour and uh, right. um, you can't afford to, to screw up. Um, I would have to say, honestly, looking back, um, I've never been in a situation where there was an unrecoverable error. Um, wow. I, I've been in many situations where there was an error of monumental proportions, either mechanically or, um, or judgment or my personal error, um, but that I refuse to give up and find a way to fix it. Uh, and that's that, that, you know, uh, the, I remember we did a, a Phil Ramon and I went to England to record uh, Elton John uh, with uh, an orchestra at, um, I don't think it was at Albert Hall, but it was at one of the, the major London halls. Um, and um, during the course of that, we had a breakdown of the multi-track machine, and it was a one-night event, and uh, we lost about eight minutes. Um, I, oh, had wow. three, uh, I had three DA-88s as backups. We go to the studio after the concert to check on them to see if we got something. And um, the, uh, the DA-88 machine at the studio started eating our one backup. <sighs> um, so uh, <sighs> I, I, I remember walking out that night and uh, saying to calling my wife and say, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but um, you know, there was another night where uh, uh, we were doing, uh, it was Elton again, uh, a, a concert at Madison Square Garden called One Night Only was the name of the concert. And um, um, the Capricorn, which was in the, uh, the uh, uh, FNL truck that we were using to record, uh, uh, crashed um, for a couple of minutes. The good news about that, though, I wasn't doing a live audio mix. So, and during the gestation of the Capricorn uh, in the early days, one of the first things I, I got them to do was to, when the console crashed, it would still pass audio to the output. So even if the console and all the software went down, uh, Phil and I, we absolutely insisted on that before we'd use it for anything. And they, within a couple of weeks, came up with the software. So when we did this concert, the audio was still passed to the tape machines, and we were able to, to get it back in the mix. So that was easier. But this particular time, uh, it was the tape machine that went down, and the DA-88s were our backup, and then those were being eaten by the machine at the studio. Oh my so gosh. Uh, we ended up getting another DA-88 machine, and then I, the only, I, the only way I could do it was I had to unspool the, the uh, um, videotape that it's on and, and, and literally kind of iron it back to oh health goodness. again. And So you got it. I, well, yeah, I, you know, in today's world, I would have got it totally because I could have used RX or something like that, you know, isotope to, to fix it. But, you know, you can hear little clicks and 
things and stuff like that on it where, you know, because it is digital after all, but uh, yeah, we got it. I think it's a pretty, I would have to say that for those kinds of shows that matter with big artists, uh, time is of the essence, meaning it's, you're capturing something live. There's not a lot of guys on the planet that they would call and just to be in that group of guys. And then, you know, you're in this other world where you're just a, a massive record producer you're a massive studio engineer right and then it's like you go do these live broadcasts where it's like that's a totally different environment i've stepped into the put a toe in that world enough to realize that wow this is not the same as that <laughs> so no. i mean just the fact that you, it seems like everything that you take on is like you're able to make it happen at a high level you know the consequences of just the elton john aspect and then you've got a symphony and then you've got a big hall and trucks and you got fiber lines going. And it's like, you know, you got backups to your backups. And I mean, just the logistics, all of that, it's like, that's, that's pretty intense. Even me as a hardcore, large format, original analog guy, looking at the other guys, that guy, you are, that's a different, you're at a different base camp on Everest than we are. <laughs> well, so, no, I, I, I thank you for the comments, but really, um, like I said, and I tell this to the students, uh, because uh, now that I'm older, that that's my that's my goal at this point is is to go into teaching somehow. In fact, uh, the Metal Alliance group that uh, that I founded with, uh, well, that was founded really by Ed Cherney, but uh, and put together in 2005. We, it's a bunch of us engineers who. Uh, feel that uh, Met Alliance, meaning Music Education and Technology Alliance. So education is now my, my, which is why I love doing podcasts, because I love getting out to students and the young people and um, saying, you know, uh, giving them whatever advice I can. Uh, and that's my goal is to, to do some teaching. But the, the idea right now is that um, there's a lot there's a lot to be said about learning all the technologies available, uh, learning uh, even in this digital world, you have to be brought up understanding analog because if you don't understand signal flow, I don't care what you do, you're not going to do it right. Um, but on the other side, there's not enough emphasis put on the psychological aspects of what we do. And, and those are the things that, like I said, you can either get the phone call and say, uh, uh, we're doing, uh, you know, PBS called me and said, we're doing Bocelli in Central Park uh, with uh, Celine Dion and with uh, David Foster and Tony Bennett and what have you. We'd like you to do it. Absolutely. You know, no question. Not even thinking about it. Right. Um, because I want to do it. And. There are others that would say, well, uh, I don't know. I, I haven't really done that kind of thing before. And then I get to Central Park and I find out, well, my truck is a quarter of a mile from the stage. And I'm saying, what's going on with that? And they say, well, the, they won't allow the truck into Central Park because of the dimensions of the truck, the recording truck it won't fit on the access roads in central park. So they, so I have to park on central park West. If you know the city sure. and the stage is in the middle of the park. So it's a oh. quarter of a mile from there to the stage, um, on the great lawn. So just um, pop out and change the mic real quick. <laughs> and, and trust me, I lost 10 pounds on that gig just running back and forth because, you know, there are times you have to be on the stage and there are times you have to be in the truck. So um, it was a, a massive undertaking. And, um, and yet throughout, I was always guided by, you know, how lucky am I to be doing this? You know, how lucky am I that someone called me up and asked me to work with these folks? Yeah. And, and I love yeah. that you've never failed in any of the no catastrophic failures out of all the well, far reaching things you've never you know, had to face your biggest fear, which would be not getting it done. Well, failure is a relative term in the sense that I've never failed in delivering. Right. Okay. Uh, 
whether or not I failed in uh, delivering what the artist or the record company or the television company wanted, that's a different thing. I, there, uh, one clearly stands to mind where I did, uh, uh, it was Grammy Legends um, in, uh, uh, I think, uh, about seven, five or six years ago for PBS. And um, I was mixing 5.1. Uh, I recorded and mixed it. The recording came out great and everything was great. And uh, I'd, be, I'd send these mixes to people. Everybody loved them. But then the, um, the, uh, uh, the, um, the video producer, and, and so in, in effect, the producer of the project, I was the audio producer, but he was the video producer, um, hated the mixes. And um, I couldn't figure out why. And uh, we even had people from PBS come up to my studio and they'd listen there and they'd say, fantastic. And then they'd go to their studio and, and it would sound terrible. I've never to this day sorted out what the problem was. But at the end, I had to do, uh, um, I, I believe it has to do with the PBS insistence um, which I've, I've been against since the very beginning, that you cannot deliver a stereo mix and a 5-1 mix uh, of a show. You can only deliver a 5-1 mix, and then they do their own fold-down. Hmm. So I've never understood that. Uh, it makes no sense to me, because anyone that's mixed in 5-1 and stereo knows there's differences. Oh, yeah. you the, can't the, rear, the rear, the sub, all it doesn't translate. The center speaker, it doesn't translate one-to-one -one from one song to the next. It's, uh, again, like we talked about, about emotion. It's not a technical thing. It's an emotional thing. And I need to do uh, the 5-1 mix to, to be best for 5-1 and the stereo mix to be best for the stereo experience. And they, uh, for... I don't know the reason, but refuse to, even if you sent them a stereo mix, they wouldn't use it. Hmm. So um, they were very disappointed in what I sent them. And, um, uh, and which is, which is sad because up until that time, I'd done a half a dozen, maybe a dozen projects with PBS and they all came out spectacular. But, since then, uh, it, it became a very strained relationship, and I don't understand why. But so that was a failure, not in my in the technical side, right. but that was a failure in delivering it's, what the producer uh, of the show wanted. We have I have a little school, a little production school that I run out of my barn, and and I tell people that that's the difference between people that really succeed and the people that don't is being able to manage those kinds of relationships where it's just like, how do you turn one record into 12 records or six records with a band? How do you turn one client into calling you every single time for what they're doing? It's there's so much more of it. And it, you have to learn, keep learning that for the rest of your life, but mm -hmm. it's more important than any of the stuff they'll teach you at a college. It's great that that college has you or who, wherever you're teaching at, whether that be online, uh, you should learn from people you respect from. We respect you. We love you. Thank you for hanging out with us. I want to thank um, Al Thurr. I don't know if you remember Al Thurr. Oh, I remember York. Al. Absolutely. So Al Thurr started me. I was like, I got to find Frank. And he had an old <laughs> contact for you. I think Give Al still had best. a Palm Pilot. Remember the Palm Pilot? Oh, yeah. Ru my buddy Al goes like to the ninth degree to keep all his technology running because he likes the old software. Uh, yeah, right, right. So. Uh, but it ended up being Brinner from the Mixing Board podcast that I had done that podcast a couple weeks ago. And he said, yeah, I got Frank's contact. So we're grateful to both of those guys for helping us track you down. And um, we'd love to have you back on and maybe dig deep into 5-1 and uh, sure. you know, just, just have Anytime. more conversations. You're a fascinating guy and we're lucky to have you on the planet doing what you're doing. Well, you know, and, and for those out there, uh, I just I have one passing point, which is that for uh, – new and aspiring engineers and so forth and producers you never lose sight of the fact that this is a service business you're in a service business you are you are there not because you're 
the best and the most amazing. You're there to get the artist's vision onto whatever the format is. You're not there for your vision. You're there for their vision. They, without them, you wouldn't be there. I mean, if, if the songwriter hadn't written the song and the artist hadn't decided to perform the song, um, you wouldn't be doing anything. So you're at the end of the day, if you always remember that, that this is, that you, uh, as George Massenburg used to say, you don't own it. It's owned by somebody else. And you are there to help them get the best out of them that you can. Um, you're, and you have talent, you're always going to succeed. Incredible advice. Amazing. Hey, uh, any place or anything you want to pitch? Any locations on the web? People can find you. Uh, well, yeah, I, I feel a little guilty because I haven't looked at it for a couple of years. My daughter set it up and I haven't looked, looked back since. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Uh, uh, take a look at it and upgrade it. So it'll be frankfilippetti.com. Um, I also have a Vimeo page, I believe, uh, but I'll, I'll post that link on the uh, frankfilippetti.com to make it easier. Um, but uh, yeah, and I encourage, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to get a, uh, the email thing going on the frankfilippetti.com because I would like to hear from people. And uh, like I say, education now is my primary uh, interest. And uh, so anybody that uh, wants to get information, I'd be happy to talk to them. Yeah. And um, what a resource. I don't know if people can comprehend the level of information they can get from a guy like you. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for being my favorite engineer ever. And I will <laughs> well, never say you. that again. Thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, for those words. It's, it's very, uh, it, it makes my day. Well, I'm glad it does. And, and you make people's, you've made whole summers for people by the records you've made. So thank you for doing that and coming on and being so candid with us. We appreciate you. That's it this week from the West Barn. We're signing off. We'll see you next time.